First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Green for having me here. You know what? Let me see a show of hands of how many people have heard of T-Town Roofing. You see that, Dr. Green? My marketing works. He, he, he helps me with all my marketing. And so, you know, that tells me he's doing a good job. You know, uh, how many people would like me to tell you the secret to success in small business? Would you like to know the secret? Well, too bad it's a secret and I don't know it either. <laughs> but there are some practical things that we can do to make, to make business happen. You know, uh, you know, I always start out everything where I go that I tell people I'm Ricky the roofer, I'm not a roofer. And you might not think about your roof until you have some shingles falling down or your spots on your ceiling. But when that happens, don't be afraid. Just call one of my boys in blue and we'll send them over. We know what to do and we'll take care of you. So that's my little elevator speech. If someone asks me what I do, that's what I say real quick on the, on the elevator. You know, I grew up in Dale City, Oklahoma. Has anybody ever heard of Dale City, Oklahoma? Has anybody seen the houses in Dale City, Oklahoma? Okay, they're not big. They're not nice. You know, I went to a school called Everly Heights, and when I walked through those halls, I acted like I was a rich kid. You know, because my dad had his own business. Now, my dad was the business, but that didn't matter to me, because to me, my dad was the business. I was proud. Well, one time about this year, you know, uh, I was bragging about how rich we were and, you know, all the good things we had. You know, it was easy to fool the students. I mean, it was easy to fool them. But it was a little tougher to fool the teachers. So we had to write this paper about what we got for Christmas. Now, the thing was, that Christmas, we didn't even have electricity. So I sure wasn't going to write and tell them that I didn't even have, no, I didn't get anything for Christmas. So what was I going to do? I was going to make something up. So I made up this elaborate story about this big white Christmas tree we had and all these remote control cars we got for Christmas. And my teacher called me out. She said, Ricky, I wish that you would just bring one of those remote control cars to school. I was stumped. I didn't really make a big deal of it, neither did the rest of the class. And luckily, the next day, the class forgot, the teachers forgot, and I got off the hook and didn't have to bring any remote control cars to class. Isn't that a good thing? But you know, one thing I learned in life, that it didn't really matter what those teachers thought about me or what those students thought about me. It mattered what I thought about me. Because you know, the only thing stopping us sometimes from doing something is thinking that we can. Just, just thinking that we can. You know, so, so many times in life we've been told that you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Why are you doing that? Well, who, who is the person telling you that and what is the really motive of telling you that you can't do that? Is it because they don't want to succeed, you succeed, or they think you should succeed? But, you know, sometimes the, the battles that we go through in life aren't always won by just the bigger, stronger, faster man, but sometimes just by the man that, that thinks that we can. You know, so what do you think that you can do? What's stopping you from thinking bigger and thinking better than you've ever thought before? Who are you hanging out with? Because the way you think is determined a lot about the people you hang out with. Sometimes business isn't just all about what you know. When I first started doing business, I thought, you know, if I could just be the best roofer in town, that man, I could make it. If I could just know more about roofing than anybody else knew, that man, I could do it. Well, I learned real soon that, you know, that, that I wasn't doing everybody's roofs, and sometimes I didn't even have a roof job to do. So I thought, I gotta recheck my thinking. So then I thought, it must be, you know, who you know. So I started going out and trying to meet all these people. But then there was another problem. There were people that I knew that I wasn't doing their roofs. And I'm sitting there at home scratching my head going, what is going on with this? I know these guys. How come they're not calling me to do their roof? And then I found out that it's really not who knows you, that not the who you know, but who knows you and who likes you. Guys, we live in a day and age of relationships where you, you've got to have the right relationships in your life to succeed. You can't do it without relationships. You know, we can't do it on our own. A lot of people like to take a lot of the credit for what we do, but, you know, we do have to have the right relationships. Another thing is, guys, we have to know what we want to do. What do you want to do? What is your business? What is your, what is your niche? You know, we have, we have to make a road map. Well, what does your life look like three years from today? Do you know? Have you thought about it? Are you just going through the motions, hoping something's going to happen, hoping that you're going to fall in this big business deal and you're going to make a million dollars overnight? If you figure that out, please call me when you do because I will be following in your footsteps. But typically, we've got to have a plan. And then we've got to work the plan. You know, and so, so what I'd like for you, some of you guys to do that are, are willing to listen to me is take some time and figure out what you want your life to look like three years from now and map that out. Now, here comes the tough part. We're going to have to eliminate some relationships in our life because once we make that map, we've got to figure out the quickest course of action to get there because three years, guys, is going to come and go before you know it. You're going to be there today. You're going to, from where you are today, you're going to be in three years before you know it. So anything that cannot help you accomplish your plan has to be eliminated. Sometimes that's friends. Sometimes that's people. Sometimes that's family. Because sometimes people are going to tell you, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. They don't know what your dream is. They don't know what your vision is. And if they can't get on board with what you're thinking, you've got to leave them off board. You've got to leave them off the boat. 
then, then find people that are where you want to be. Find people that have done what you want to do. Guys, your mentors are not going to chase you down. Dr. Green did not come looking for me. He did not come looking for me and say, hey, Ricky, can I help you? No, I went looking for Dr. Green saying, please help. I need help. And guess what? He was willing to help. And I've got other mentors in my life too, but none of these people came and chased me down. But successful people are always typically willing to tell you what they did on their journey to get to success. And guys, success is not, a, is not an overnight instant gratification type of deal. Success is a journey. You're going to have to make great decisions to get to the top of the mountain, but you're going to have to make even better decisions to stay at the top of the mountain. And once you're at the top, you've always got trying to people to pull you down. So that's so important why that you, you care about what you think about you and not what other people think about you. Because some of the stuff I hear about me sometimes, I don't believe it's true, but I just brush it off. Because if you're not doing nothing, people aren't going to talk about you. And the only way to have nobody talk about you is just don't do nothing. The only problem with that is nothing times nothing is nothing, and then you won't get nothing, you won't have nothing, you won't be nothing. So anytime you do something, somebody's going to say something. There's always going to be a critic that says, you could have done it better, you could have done it like this, you could have done it faster, you could have done it slower, but you know what? They're sitting there while you're doing. They're sitting there while you're doing. It's what you're doing, and it's what you're doing going to develop the reward that you want. Because every action has an equal or opposite reaction. I mean, you, you, anything that you do is going to produce something. Is it producing what you want in your life? Guys, you've got to have counsel in your life. There's a wisdom and multitude of counsel. Don't just get some great idea and think that you're, you know, you're uh, the gift to the world and you're going to go and you know, take it all on by yourself. When you get a great idea, I'll tell you, you know, I, I faced business decisions in my life to where, man, I just was ripping and roaring. I was trying to hit a home run at every situation and then my money ran out. I'm like, oh no, now what? You know, if I were to ask questions beforehand, I may, maybe could have kept some of my money. Guys, there, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. You know, the question we ask determines the answer we receive. If you don't ask the question, you're not going to get an answer. You know, so don't be afraid to ask people who've been there and done that. Some guys are going to be jerks and tell you that they don't want to help you. Some people are going to, you know, not going to want to show you the ropes. When I, when I was 25 years old, I, I met a guy in the parking lot of, out of a, at a research grocery store. He's, he owns one of the biggest roofing companies here in town. And I thought I was bragging. I told him how many roofs I sold this month. And he goes, man, if I had one roofing salesman that sold that many in a week, I would fire him. And I had to talk about burst my bubble. You know, here I am thinking I'm so good. But, you know, so you might be good compared to the people you're around. You know, and, and they, they say our life, we can look at the five people we're the closest to. And we're about the average of those five people. When I figured that out, I thought, man, my friends better be changing every five years because I'm moving up. Guys, because nothing ever stays the same. You're either moving up or you're moving back. And I like moving up a lot better than I like moving back. But this man, he said, I'll tell you what. Because I, I told him, I said, wait, wait a minute. How do you sell all these jobs? He goes, I'll tell you what. Call me here and I'll have lunch with you. And I'll tell you everything that we do. He goes, and he, he looked at me in the face and he goes, I'm going to tell you why I'm going to tell you what we do. Because I know you won't do it. And I said, oh, I won't do it. But see, he told the wrong guy what he did. And, you know, and I, I met him the other day trying to buy his company. He's not ready to sell it yet, but I'm going to be buying it in the future. <laughs> and, and I set him down because, you know, we, we had a meeting, and he knew what my company was. And he came to the meeting, and, you know, we, we were trying to negotiate the deal, and he's just not ready to sell yet. But I told him that day I met him in the parking lot. And I said, you remember those nine things you told me? I said, look at my company now. We've done all nine, sir. Is there a tenth one? <laughs> You know, our culture has almost taught us to be afraid of problems. Guys, don't be afraid of problems. Don't be afraid of anything. But business is nothing more than solving problems. The type of problem you solve the type, determines the type of reward that you get. We're here to solve problems. Look and find ways for you to solve problems on a daily basis. Our culture has trained us to, if it's a problem, to run from it. Don't deal with that. Take medication for that. Guys, the people that can solve the biggest problems get the biggest paychecks. Don't get stressed out when problems happen. We have problems in my business every day. There's problems in every company every day. And the big paychecks goes to the guys that can look at those problems and go, I can find an answer. So don't be afraid to find an answer. The first answer you find might not be the right answer. But if you keep trying to solve that problem, you're going to come up with it. If you just will determine, I'm a problem solver. I'm a problem solver. When, when, when you start your business, you're going to have 10 phone calls you get to make. Three of them are going to be angry customers, five of them are going to be happy customers, and three of them are going to be people who want to pay you. 
is going to be tempting to call those people who want to pay you first. But guys, those mad people, the people that are the problem, that are upset, are the, the first one that you want to take care of. Because they're the problem. Whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent, you want to cool those people off as fast as you can. Because we, we live in a day and age where stuff can go viral in an instant. You want to take care of those people because a lot of times all it is is just a lack of communication. Which is my next point here. Learn to communicate. Guys, how many times have you know, you've been in a conversation with somebody and someone's talking to you and you're so busy thinking about what you're going to say next you don't even hear what they say? Guys, the key to communication is listen. Listen to what people are saying. Don't be so quick to have to have an answer. Because after, and sometimes you don't even have to have an answer. Sometimes the best response is no response at all. You know, sometimes we get so, we get so defensive when someone's telling us we're doing something wrong. And, and we might be 100% right. But at this point in time, is it going to do us any good to try to convince that person that we're right and they're wrong? If they believe in their believer that they're right. Sometimes it's just good to be quiet. Let them listen, let them yell, let them cuss, let them do whatever they want to say and just, and just listen. And then typically, instead of having a defense, ask a question. Questions, questions can take people where you want to go and find out really what the root of the problem is because sometimes people are just mad because you didn't talk to them right. You didn't look at them right. You didn't call them when you're supposed to call. Stuff that can be fixed easily if you're not trying to get defensive. Guys in the business, you're going to mess up, or at least I do. You're going to have issues where days don't go right, where projects don't go right, where your people that were supposed to do what they're supposed to do didn't show up. When that happens, don't start trying to make excuses. Just tell the people, say, look, we are here where we are now. You chose us to take care of this for you, and we did not do it as you expected. But we're not backing up, and we're not backing down, and it's all we can go on is go forward and fix it from here. Will you still work with me? Can I help you solve the problem? People are e typically easy to work with. They're going to tell you yes. Guys, this is so important. No does not mean no. You know what no means? No means you have not convinced me yet. And you know that the biggest thing about no you need to learn is it's one of the hardest words in the English dictionary to say. People just do not like to say no or they don't like to walk in front of that speaker right there with the microphone. <laughs> you know, but when someone tells you no, one of the first things you want to ask yourself is, does this person have the authority to tell me yes? Because they, they might not be able, to, be able to tell you yes. They might be a no person. You've got to find some yes people. I remember the first time I taught my wife this lesson, she was, I, we came home and some, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but she was laying on the floor crying because someone had turned us down for some kind of business loan or some kind of extension on our credit. I mean, she is bawling on the floor. And I said, baby, get up. What's the matter? She goes, this is not going to happen. It's not going to work. I said, well, who did you talk to? She said, the teller. <laughs> I said, honey, the teller does not have the authority to say yes. Let's make sure we're talking to the right person. So guys, make sure you're always talking to the right person. You know, and, and no matter what kind of business you're in, it's a sales and marketing business. You know, if you're doing your presentation, make sure you're doing your presentation in the front of the people that can say yes. Make sure you're doing your presentation in front of all the parties that are going to be there to say yes. Because, you know, once you give your presentation, that's your presentation. What's the hesitation? They need to say yes, right? And if you give your presentation and they don't have the authority to say yes, you've wasted your time, their time, your company's time. And you know what? Time, we can't get it back. You know, everybody says we're all created equal. Dr. Green, you might get mad at me for this, but I don't think we are. I don't think we're all created equal. I think we all have different gifts and different talents. And we need to find out what those are. <clears throat> we need to find out what we're good at and work on those issues. But what we all are given is 24 hours in a day. And what separates us is how we use those 24 hours in a day. And guys, that's the only thing we can't get a refund on. And once those 24 hours are up, it's, it's, they're done. You know, people either say, you know, you either spend your time or you invest your time. And I'll just ask you on a daily basis, what are you doing? Are you spending your time or are you investing your time? Now, you guys are in school right now. That's, that's a good thing. I, I love the name of this college, Community Care. You know, because when people know that you care, when they know that you care, they'll go the extra mile for you. You know, when you have a problem on a job site and the people know that you care, they'll, they'll stand by you. But if they think you don't care, is, is, when, uh, is when you can get in trouble. Guys, you've got to do what you say you're going to do. If you're going to be in business, do not over-promise and under-deliver. Always under-promise and over-deliver. You know, we, we, it's so easy to try to tell people what they want to hear. But we just have to tell them the truth. You know, you can't tell them something that you can't make happen just to get the signature on the page. You know? 
it is it's really simple. Show up on time, do what you say you're going to do, and bring what you say you're going to bring. Ta-da. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, it, it'll be amazing how good you're going, how good you're doing business. You know, we've been, in, we've been in business here at six years in Tulsa, and we got voted best of the best. Is it because we've never made a mistake? No, it's because when we make a mistake, we're willing to admit it, we're willing to correct it. We are, and and if, we, if we can't do what we say we're going to do, we're going to call them before the deadline approaches and say, look, you know, something happened, the truck broke down, this happened. It would be easier for us to start tomorrow or the next day, but if, you, if you're going to be mad at me, we'll be there today. And most people will not tell you they're going to be mad at you. You know, some of them will. And so you just got to do what you got to do and try to improvise, but just make sure that we're, when you do what you say you're going to do. Guys, oh man, you know, in America, I don't, I don't care what they tell you on the news about the state of our economy or the job situation. Guys, we live in the best country in the entire world. But it's time for us to do the end and then some. Does anybody know what the and then some is? It means you got to wake up a little bit earlier than your competition. You got to work a little bit later than your competition. You actually got to be the best at what you do. The days of just showing up for a paycheck, those days are over. Now, the government might still give you a paycheck, but those ain't very big and they don't spend very long. You've got to be the best at what you do. You've got to read more than your competition. You've got to work harder than your competition. You've got to be more innovative than your competition. You know, because today we, got, we, we face the Google shopper, guys. And then you get embarrassed when your shopper knows more than you. you you've got to know what you know, and you've got to know it better than anybody else. What does that mean? You've got to become an expert on it. Now, you say, how am I going to become an expert on something? Well, the experts say, whoever the experts are, Dr. Green probably knows them. I've never met them. But if you study a subject three hours a day for 365 days, you can be an expert. Is that true? Or am I making those numbers up? 10,000 hours. What's that? 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Okay, my numbers are a little bit off. Maybe three, three hours a day for three years. <laughs> you can become an expert on any given field that you want. But it's up to you to become the expert. It's up to you to become the expert. Nobody can do it for you. Your mama can't do it for you. Your daddy can't do it for you. Dr. Green can't do it for you. And I sure am not going to do it for you. But you, sitting in that chair from where you are today, can decide to be an expert on any field that you want to become an expert in. The question is, what's stopping you? The only thing stopping you is you. Are you willing to pay the price? You know, I read in a book just the other day that rich people educate themselves and poor people entertain themselves. And I would just wonder how much time do we spend entertaining ourselves instead of educating ourselves? You know, everybody wants to be rich. They really do. I mean, you know, we lay around at night thinking about, oh, my God, what can I do to have all this money? But when it comes time to paying the price to get that money, very few of us are willing to do what it takes to achieve our dreams. I thought she was walking out on me. I was like, man, I'm just getting started. And I'm already cleaning the room out. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I've learned in my business is I will never ask anybody to do anything that I've not done myself. Six years ago when I came to, the, to Tulsa, I was the business. I was up at 6 o'clock in the morning passing out flyers every morning before I went to school. I'd pass out flyers till my feet bled, and I would listen to people talk about all, they, all they're giving up and all this and all they're doing. And, I'm thinking, and I'm, all I'm thinking about is what I'm building. You know, when I first came here, I would sell the job. I would manage the job. I would collect the check. I would final invoice the job. I would run the nail magnet. I would pick up the shingles. I did it all. There's nothing in my organization that I can ask somebody to do that I haven't done myself. Now, you might not have to do it, but you should never ask somebody to do something that you're not willing to do. You know, it's just uh, something, at least, it's, it's something I've built my business on. You can take that for what you want. Guys, in business, business is a roller coaster. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs, but when you walk into your office, the people in your office can't see those ups and downs on your shoulder. I like to say it like you've got to be a chameleon. You've got to blend in. You know, sometimes you're going to have in your office, some employees might come in there and start cussing you out. They might start yelling, screaming, throwing a temper tantrum. None of you ever acted like that to your bosses, have you? <laughs> you know, but the, the main thing is when that happens, you've got to remain cool. Just because someone else is yelling and screaming and acting crazy doesn't mean you should. doesn't mean you can't. Because the, the best response to someone acting crazy is you just sit there and act like a chameleon. You just blend right in. You just get a little smile on your face and you go, okay, I see what you're saying. Because, you know, then, then they feel like an idiot. But if you yell back and scream and start talking and acting like them, who's in control? You let this employee or this customer come in and take control of your office. That's your business. That's your place. You're in control. No one's going to change your attitude. No one's going to change your mind. You are who you are, when you are, and what you are. And they can't move you. You can't change. Now, you can, but you should not. Yeah. 
Guys, business is supposed to be enjoyable. Find something you like to do and then find a way to get paid for it. Now I've been roofing so long, I don't even feel like I have a job. You know, I, I, I honestly, I don't feel like I show up and go to work. I know what to do, I love what I do, and, 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 I, and I'm good at it. I believe I'm the best at it. But I didn't become the best at it overnight. I, I became the best at it because I decided that I was going to be the best at it. You know, this year I've had different uh, independent market research companies come in and tell us that we're the most recognizable brand in Tulsa. And Dr. Green, I haven't even told you this yet, but someone actually just offered me $2 million just for our brand last week. I didn't sell. <laughs> you know, but, you know, find out, find something you like to do and do it. And, you know, because uh, if, if, if you don't enjoy your life, what's the purpose of it? If, if, no matter how much money you have, if you're not happy going to work, you're not happy solving the problems that you're solving, why solve them? Find something you love to do and do it well. Guys, is that 30 minutes or is that 10 minutes? Are we waiting for questions? Okay, let's start questions. Okay. All right. So what we typically do, um, just so you know, we have um, a program, a computer program, where they send in their questions. Okay. So we can start off the questions. You can one of our first ones. Um, what are three things that you think our students should remember um, for starting a business in Tulsa? Starting a business in Tulsa. Count your expenses. Count your costs. And then whatever you think those are going to be, double them. Because <laughs> it's typically always a lot more than, it, uh, than, than you think it is. Don't hire people that you think that can be good. Hire people that are good. Find the best people in the industry. And keep your word. Okay. We're waiting for the, first, uh, okay. the questions to come in. So we can see it a little bit. But I guess as we wait... Um, what was your greatest failure as an entrepreneur, and then how did you spin around and then take off from that? My greatest failure as an entrepreneur was the, the first year that we did the most revenue that we've ever did. We, we did that $10 million in, a, in 2009, and I got this bright, bright idea that everybody should make $1,000 a week. You know, and that's great. My heart was right. I thought that was a, a good thing, but the, the, real, the real issue is that you, you cannot pay somebody more than revenue that they bring in. And so I just, uh, I, I overpaid employees that uh, couldn't bring in the revenue. And I turned it around by, stop doing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's still a lot of questions. Okay. okay, so what was it that made you branch out and go out on your own from your father's uh, business? You know, my dad is a genius. And you know, he was one of those guys that micromanaged everything. He wanted to make every decision on his own. He wanted to make every phone call on his own. He wanted to be involved on every decision. And you know, when you see my dad, he still runs a great thriving business, but he's always got five cell phones to his ear. He's answering this person's questions, this person's questions. And I wanted to create an environment where people got to make their own choices. I wanted to hire people I could trust and then let, let them do it. My office pretty much runs without me. I have great people in great positions to where what I can do is I can work on the future and I can work on the plan instead of the day and day hustle and bustle. Mm -hmm. And I, I never could get my dad to see the bigger vision of, you know, we don't have to make all these decisions. They might not make the decision that we would want them to make, but we can trust them to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. All right, our first question in from the web. What were the tips that the other roofer passed along to you? Someone wants to know your secrets. You know, it's been so long. Let me see if I can remember them. Take a certain percentage of the top revenue and spend it in marketing. You know, uh, t told me how to pay my sales staff. Told me uh, what he did to get jobs. Taught me how to get into the commercial uh, real estate business, real estate business, roofing business. And those are all the ones I can think of right off the top of my head. That's okay. All right. Next question. What was it like working with family? And then you know how people say, never work with family, but what's your take on that? I just fired my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, so... Um, Please explain. Yes. You know, my, my wife is very great at what she does. Okay? And um, well, there's no way I could be where I am today without her help. And she was able to bring us to a certain level. She was my CFO and also my COO. So that means she carried two, two hats. And, you know, and she was able to bring us to a certain spot, but it, it came to the point in time to where we grew to a size that her management capabilities no longer could coincide with what we were trying to do. 
So we really just kind of outgrew her. She kind of she she built great systems. You know, she made an entire office paperless. I mean, she just she's an amazing woman. That but she she was great at run, running a company up to about five million dollars a year. But now we need someone that can run a thirty million dollar a year company. All right. Next question in from a text. Um, how are you able to overcome people pushing you who are not supportive supportive of your life? So those people who are talking down to you, negative. How did you overcome that? You know, one of the things you got to realize first of all is that uh, the, the people who are the closest to you, when you start doing better than they do, they're going to be the first ones to get mad at you and try to bring you down. So what you got to do is you just got you got you got to just brush it off and you got to you got to stop hanging out with them. You know, I mean, I know that sounds rude and, and crude or whatever, but if, if someone can't help you accomplish your dream and your vision, you shouldn't have no room for them in your life. You know, you, I mean, you don't have to be rude to them. You don't have to cuss them out or do anything like that. But but at the end of the day, you need to have you need to have people that support you, that believe in you, and and can help you accomplish your task. Okay. And then, what's your greatest piece of advice for people? Because not everyone in here is going to go and start their own business. But what's your greatest piece of advice for those people who are going to be working for a small business? So for employees or something. You know, show up on time. Do what they ask you to do. And, and, and the end some. You know, I, I hired a guy just about two years ago. When I hired him, he had $32 in his pocket. You know, uh, at the end of this year, I'm probably going to end up profit sharing with this guy or giving him some kind of, uh, some kind of some, something to stay because he just always does whatever it takes. You know, I'm not having to ask him to solve problems. He never comes to me with a problem without a solution. You know, he, 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 when I got back, I got back from a roofing conference just a little while ago, and, and he had a whole list of things of how we could save money. It wouldn't have to change my vision or things that I need to change about the company. It's like, look, the guys are leaving the white lights on. The water in the bathroom is running all the time. You know, uh, the, the guy mowing our grass, we could probably get it done for a little cheaper. So just, just try, to, try to be a problem solver in your company and, and solve problems that maybe you're not even supposed to solve and, and don't, don't be that person that's always pointing out what's wrong, guys. Because with every company, there's going to be stuff that's wrong. There's going to be ways that you think that you can do better. I wouldn't offer that advice until you're asked. You know, and once you've solved enough problems, somebody will ask you. But just, you know, do what you're told to do. Follow the instructions. And then do the end sum. Okay, so you mentioned reading. Mm -hmm. um, what are some books that you have found that are good for... Okay. Coming on up, starting your own business. Now, I will tell you, I did not read my first book until I was 27 years old. Okay? And I said, oh my God, there's information in these things. <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I read a book called Think and Grow Rich, which totally changed the way that I thought. It's, 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 it's a little weird. You can't take everything out of the book, but as any book, you can take bits and pieces out of it. But this guy, Napoleon Hill, did a study over 30 years of the richest people in the world and the poorest people in the world, and he found the biggest determining factor was just the way that they thought. And you know, and then uh, another book that I read was uh, The E-Myth was a really good book, uh, Turn This Ship Around, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, uh, and those, those are some really good books to start with. Okay. All right, we've got a slew of questions that just came in. Okay, um, how do you contribute or add value to a group when you feel like they're ignoring you? You know, when I walk into a room, I come, I walk into the room with the assumption that everybody loves me, and if they don't, then there's something wrong with them. <laughs> you know? so, so if someone's ignoring me, I just think that's, that's something's wrong with that guy, he's a weirdo or something. I'm going to find someone who does what I want to have to offer, and someone who doesn't want to ignore me. You know, because when, when you get around people that act like they're too good, there's one really no fun to be around anyway. And if they're ignoring you, why? And it, you know, never take it personal. Business isn't personal. That guy might be ignoring you just because, you know, he, he was intimidated by you. So, you know, never, never take it personal just because you think someone's ignoring you. Or, you know, a, a real quick story. There was a, a guy that I was trying to sell a roof to. His name was Ron Miller. He owns a uh, MPI up here, manufacturing company. And I don't get intimidated that easy. I really don't. But he came in there, and I'm, I'm giving him his roof bid. And he, he comes in, he brings me into his boardroom. And he's this white-haired gentleman. He's got a nice suit and tie. And, he sits at one end and he sits at the other end and I got one of my training guys with me and I got this whole presentation that I'm getting ready to lay out. And I broke every rule in the book, man, because I was scared. I, I, don't, I didn't know the time I was scared, but I was like, oh, here's the price of you, this much money. And that, that's not how you sell a job. You don't ever give the price first. But then I ended up joining this other organization called the IFCB where I got to know this guy. 
And I found out this guy's not scary at all. He's not even a little scary. He's one of the nicest guys you could ever get to know. But because my perception of him was wrong, then I acted inadequate. So just I so from that time from that moment is when I learned that I was going to act like everybody loves me, everybody likes me, and if they don't, well, you need help. <laughs> Marry my wife. <laughs> That's honest again. Okay, all right. Okay. How, sorry for you guys. I don't know if you could hear my question. I didn't turn this way. But um, how do you balance work and life as an entrepreneur? Work and family, excuse me. Work and family. Well, I have uh, eight children. How many children? I got seven children. Oh, wow. Uh, four adopted boys. You know, uh, me and my wife had uh, we had two girls. We started praying for boys. We wanted a boy next. And so within just a matter of time, all these boys showed up at my front step. And it was supposed to just be there for the holidays, but no one ever came back to get them. So we, we've, got, we've got seven children, ages from 10 months to 14 years old. You know, and you know, uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that we do is we make sure that our quality time is quality time. We don't watch a lot of television. You know, we don't, uh, we don't just do, we just don't do a lot of hanging out. You know, like we, we do the Hanks games, you know, where we put on boxing gloves and we box. All my kids do wushu, so, you know, we have little karate tournaments in the house. And they're beating, they're beating each other up, but they love it. You know, um, you know I take, I, I've got two daughters. I take, I alternate years and I, I take each one of them on a daddy-daughter cruise where they get some daddy, one-on-one -on -one daddy time. And you know, I dress them up like princesses and just make sure that they, that they know that they're my world. You know, and uh, so it's really that when I spend time with them, I make sure it's the right kind of time with them we're in front of a television set or something like that. What type of charities are you involved with and what do you do? You know, um, well, right now we're involved with the 200 Bicycle Giveaway that uh, is, was BCC and uh, my organization that I'm the vice president of got behind that and raised a lot, a lot of money for it. And it's uh, the YBT, the Young Businessmen of Tulsa. And guys, any of you guys that I see mainly ladies here in the crowd, and it is a men's group. Do I see any men? I do see some men, but it's we, we on the second Monday of every month we hold a luncheon and it's a uh, it's a businessman's group because when I learned business, I learned everything the hard way. I had people telling me information that was so that they could get a paycheck, and sometimes that cost me a lot of money. So me and this guy named Matt Moore, with the help of Ted Robinson, decided we're going to start a mentorship program for young men to where they could learn about business without having to pay for it like I did. And so on the second Monday of every month we have lunch at Tiamo's. It's a free lunch. I paid for it. And the only, re only requirements are either you're going to be in business, you are in business, or you're in school to be in business. And so uh, it is an invitation group only, but I'm inviting anybody here that you can come. And uh, it's the Young Businessmen of Tulsa. It's a, it's a thing that, you know, you, the lunch is free every month. It is a membership that you can do to get in the mentorship program. Uh, but, but, it, but it's really just about all about giving back. You know, that same organization raised $27,000 for a, a guy in our group that came down with cancer. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we try to give back. Okay, sales secrets and tips. Sales. What are some that you can, yeah, sales secrets and tips. Do you have anything that you can um, share with us today? You know, my true role when I started this company is, is what I'm the best at is I'm, I'm a natural salesperson. You know, when, when you're asking sales, when, we, when you're trying to close a deal, you don't ever want to give anybody all the information that you have. Do you know why? Because once you've given them all that information, then you're not valuable anymore because you told them everything that you know. I might have told a lady about the kind of felt paper we're going to use. Now, these are roofing terms because it's what I'm familiar with. The kind of shingles that we're going to use, the kind of nails we're going to use. And she doesn't care about any of that. Because all she cares about is what, are you, going to, are you going to clean up my flowers? Or are you going to damage my trees or anything like this? So I spent an hour talking about all these technical terms. And all she cares about is what's going to happen to my flowers. So a salesman always asks questions. You ask questions to identify answers, and then you can close doors by asking the right questions. And once you've asked the right question, they have no choice but to do business with you. you know, like one of the first things I'll always say when I'm talking to someone that needs a roof, I'll say, you know, is there anything stopping us from doing business today? You know, uh, what is it that you're looking for in a roofing company? You know, have you ever had a roof project done before? What is it that you like about your roof? Because I just want to ask so many questions that they start telling me what they want in a roofer so that they're telling me what they want to hear so I can tell them what they want to hear so I can get the contract signed. And, and another thing is, for the main thing for sales is constant contact create contracts. Okay, you have, a salesperson has constantly got to be in the field doing what he does. 
You know, you got to set a schedule. When it's time to work, you go to work. That means you're on the phone, you're in front of people. If the office doesn't have leads for you, you're trying to track down your own leads. You're doing whatever it takes to get in front of people because if you're not in front of people, you don't have a product to sell. You know, uh, and, and a lot of people at, at this day and age that, you know, are working on commission, they think they're too good to make cold calls. They think they're too good to, you know, try to create, gen generate business on their own. Well, I'll tell you, the only, way to, the only way to make it as a salesman is to do constant contacts. You've got to constantly be making contacts. And don't really set up yourself a sales goal for how many sales you want to make in a week because sometimes that's going to set yourself up for failure. But you can set a goal for how many contacts you're going to make. How many contacts am I going to make this week? How many phone calls am I going to make this week? And before long, you'll be able to break it down when you know every time you pick up that phone how much money you're going to make. Um, kind of spinning off of that, I have a question. Okay. What, what is your best advice for generating leads? What do you think is most effective? Would you say social media, going to different networking groups, just knocking on doors? How? We do that all. <laughs> all of it. We, we do that all. You know, the, 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 the best marketing is, you know, it really depends on budget, what kind of revenue you have. You know, um, but we do, we do radio, we do uh, Facebook, we do Twitter, we do direct mail. Um, so, you know, we, we have a, a sign at the baseball field for the Tulsa Drillers. You know, so, so as far as marketing, it's really kind of industry selective. You know, so for what works for the roofing industry might not work for the new car industry, or the used car industry, or the vacuum cleaner industry. But, you know, as, as many resources, you, this is what you got to do. You got to find out where your target people are, and you got to find them. All right. Next question: Do you think that entrepreneurs are born, or are they made, and then why? I know that you said not everyone is created equally. So, go ahead. Entrepreneurs born or made? You know, I think I think they're made. You know, I, I don't think when I was a little boy, I just laid around and dreamed about being a roofer. You know, my, my dad started taking me to work with him when I was five years old, and at, at that time I was really kind of mad about it, you know, because all my other friends were out playing, having fun, and I'm getting drug along on these roofs and seeing my dad close deals and sell jobs and collect checks, and before long I started liking it, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm a young man, I got a little bit of money in my pocket, and I'm, I'm solving problems, and so I, I, I often wonder what I would have been in my life if my dad didn't thrust me into the roofing industry. So I, I believe the answer to that question is, is both. They're, they're made and born. All right. Our very last question that we ask all of our speakers, the name of this club is called Shift okay. Your Mindset and Propel Your Career. Okay. So what's the last piece of advice that you want to impart to all the students who are in this room? And I guess even to the instructors and the faculty and staff that are here as well. Okay. Can you ask me that question one more time? That's kind of a deep question. <laughs> If you could only say one more thing to this group of people, what would you tell them to help them to shift their mindsets and propel their careers? You know, guys, you know, time is limited, and so we really have to know what our limits are. Mm -hmm. And everybody's limits are different. We have to know in our life when we should push the limits, when we should be when it should be off limits, or when it should just be limited. So just, just limit your time. And when I say off limits, there's some things that some of us shouldn't be touching. There's some things that some places some of us shouldn't be going. When it's time to push the limits, how much of this can I do? How fast can I get it done? And then what should I limit in my life? Like television, video games. You know, and so, so just, just look at the limits and set your limits. And then, you know, I believe you can achieve your goals. All right, well, that's the end of the questions that we have.